Welcome to Word Painting in Haydn's The Creation. Now, for those of you who may not know, Word Painting is a musical depiction of the text, onomatopoeia of music. You know, if you think in Messiah, um, the crooked straight, the crooked straight, and the rough places plain, right? The crooked line and then plain with held notes. There's a perfect example of word painting. Uh, a lot of the word painting in creation happens in the orchestra and soloist music, and that's where we're going to concentrate tonight. You know, as choral singers, we work for weeks, months to prepare a concert. We get deeply involved in all the choral sections. But how much time do we get to listen to the soloist and orchestra? One rehearsal, maybe two, if we're lucky, uh, before the concert. And then it's a run through. We don't get as deeply involved. So tonight we're going to explore some of the wonderful word painting that Haydn does. You know, Haydn was a master of the orchestra. He wrote 106 symphonies, knew his way around the orchestra. And uh, you'll see what I'm talking about tonight. Just a little bit about Haydn and the piece itself. Uh, Haydn basically spanned the 18th century, born in 1732, died in 1809. This piece was written uh, at the very end of the 18th century, um, 1797, 1798, thereabouts. The piece was premiered in 1799 and the, was first published in 1800, interestingly published in German and English. The text uh, was taken, the, the text it was taken from a poem called The Creation of the World. The author is unknown. That poem was in English, taking um, uh, passages from the Bible, uh, the book of Genesis, using the King James Version, uh, also some Psalms, Milton's Paradise Lost. Haydn gave the English text to his colleague, uh, Gottfried von Swieten, who translated it into German. Haydn then set the German text, and then von Swieten retranslated that into English. And that may be why the English is so sort of awkward and halting. The recording we're going to use tonight does use uh, the English text because I thought it would be more uh, uh, available uh, to most of us to uh, follow this in English. Uh, a little bit about the recording. It's a live performance uh, from um, 2012. Uh, I was looking at various recordings. I wanted something on YouTube, which would be easily accessible. Uh, and this one, you can hear the orchestra very clearly, and that's why I chose this. Uh, you can hear the orchestra better than in some of the other recordings. Um, it was recorded in a town called Brixen, in the cathedral in Brixen, Italy. I had to look this up. It's a small town in the north of Italy, uh, in the Alps, close to the Austrian border. And as I said, it was recorded live in the cathedral there in 2012. Now, the work of the creation is set in three parts. Parts one and two deal with the creation of the world. And part three is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Part one, uh, and you can uh, see day by day what's being created. Part one is days one through four and deals with the separation of darkness from the light, heaven from earth, creation of the sun and the moon, and waters and plants. Uh, part two is day five and six, creation of animals and humans. And then, as I said, part three is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So let's start. Um, I hope you can see the music on the screen. The overture is the representation of chaos. It begins with a big, loud, open C, which is a little bit reminiscent of the Big Bang. And then various instruments come in and are used sparingly. To give this idea of open space, there's little going on. You see perhaps things floating by. You hear a flute. You hear a bassoon. Uh, 
things, but coming in in random. However, there's something else going on. And if you're a music theory geek like I am, this will be interesting to you. If you're not a music theory geek like I am, look interested, all right? When we talk about closely related keys, we don't mean close on the keyboard, like C is next to C sharp is next to D. We mean how many notes are there in common between two keys. So for example, C major and G major are the two closely most closely related keys. Every, there's every note in common except one. In G major, you have an F sharp. That's the only note that's not also found in C major. So every time you go up a perfect fifth or you go to the fifth note of the scale, C major, you go to the fifth note of the scale, you're a G. G major, you go to the fifth note of the scale, you're a D. Uh, has every note in common but one. We're adding sharps. The same thing is true going down a fifth, adding flats. If you're in minor and you go to major, you have what's called the relative minor and major. This begins in C minor, and the relative major is E flat major. That would be the easiest place to go, and you would think Haydn would go there, but no. And I'll explain why in just a moment, uh, and why I think this is one of the representations of chaos. So let's listen to about the first 20 measures or so of the overture. Here we go. Look with me now, we're about at measure 17, where you see uh, the arrow. And what Haydn does at this point, now look at measure 19 and look at the upper notes in the orchestra. You hear the E flat going to D, and you expect it to go back to E flat, modulating to E flat major. From C minor. As I said, closely related key, easy to do that. So you expect Haydn to do but he doesn't. Starting here again, he delays the resolution and you get this to D flat here at the letter A. Going from C to D flat was just about unheard of in Haydn's time. This was a modulation that was uh, completely unexpected. Haydn, that wild and crazy guy. So for me, 
this is really one of the representations of chaos. Now, in truth, going from C minor to D flat major is not as far off as uh, C major to D flat major, but never mind. Going from C to D flat as a modulation uh, was really unusual in Haydn's time, uh, just completely invented. All right, the next uh, few depictions of word painting do involve voices and the chorus. The first one, very famous, especially if you've sung the piece, um, is the uh, creation of light. So uh, you'll hear this singing, um, the world was without form and void, and um, the darkness was upon the face of the earth. Now, notice that the chorus comes in very softly, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. I want you to pay attention to how Haydn sort of makes you wait, wait for it, the use of rests here. Right, moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, wait, let there be light, wait, and there was huge crashing light. Okay, so let's listen to this, and I'll move the score along uh, as, we, as we do this. So apparently in the first performance, when the chorus got to that big, loud C major chord on Let There Be Light, it literally stopped the show. The orchestra couldn't continue for several minutes. There was such a stir in the audience uh, from what, what Haydn did. It's just really incredible. All right, so uh, we move on. 
now uh, to uh, day two. And um, this is also a section with um, voices. This is taken from Paradise Lost, the depiction of the defeat of Satan's host. Uh, and you'll notice that the tenor goes quite low in his range, uh, uh, perhaps signaling defeat. And then when the chorus comes in, it's uh, quite disjunct. The chorus is talking about, uh, you know, despairing, cursing rage. Uh, the entrance, entrances are fugal with the chorus uh, uh, sections coming in at different times and um, speaking the text at different times, uh, large leaps of intervals, uh, chromatic, and then the chorus gets to the text, a new created world. And suddenly it's homophonic, everybody's singing the same words at the same time, everyone has come together, it's soft, it's beautiful, but I think more important than that, it is uh, the sense of unison of the new created world. So let's listen first to the tenor and then the chorus coming in. Starting here. Have a new world, we're all in peace and harmony. And then God starts to divide the waters from the land, and you get uh, a sense of elements. Now, Haydn absolutely depicts, as you see, storms, wind, lightning, thunder, rain, hail, and snow. And the reason I've labeled this is that. Haydn gives you the music first and then describes what you've just heard. So I thought it would be a little more useful for you to see whether this is rain or wind or storms as you hear it. So let's see how Haydn depicts all these elements for you. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. the first of the storm. Outrageous storms, now dreadful arose. <laughs> Impelled by the clouds, by heaven's fire, the sky is inflamed. And awful thunders are rolling on high. Steams descend, 
So, so beautiful, just a, such a wonderful depiction of what he's talking about. Now we have a depiction of the sea. This is an aria for bass. Notice how Haydn's depiction of the churning sea, the storms at sea, the crashing waves, the rolling waves, uh, and how he deals with this in the orchestra. It's another wonderful depiction of what's going on this time the storms at sea. So he carries on for a while uh, talking about the uh, storms at sea. And then we get to the creation of the sun and the moon. Now the sunrise is one of my absolute favorite moments in this piece and one of my favorite moments in music. So I wanna talk a little bit about theory again and talk about Haydn's use of suspensions. In music, a suspension occurs when a note is suspended, held over, tied from one chord to the next. The note which is suspended becomes dissonant with the new chord and resolves down by step. So if you see here, the D is then held over and becomes dissonant and then we go on, measure four, the G is suspended and becomes dissonant. And then the A is suspended and becomes dissonant. And this series of tension and release, tension and release, coupled with the rising line, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, and if you, Think about a sunrise, how absolutely majestic it is, and the slow sunrise until the sun is at its full glory. This is absolutely a perfect depiction of that, one of my most favorite moments. We'll begin with the wretched T before that so you hear what we're talking about. Here we go. Let heavy lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and to give light upon the earth. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. He made the stars. Oh, listen to the tension. Beautiful rising love.
Now, we switch now from the sun to the moon and listen to the different color that Haydn uses in the orchestra. That was bold and uh, full and majestic. This is very soft. It's a softer palette. Uh, uh, the word silver comes to mind. Uh, as we think about the difference, how one experiences the moon as opposed to the sun. All right. After this, this goes ataka into one of the most famous choruses, The Heavens Are Telling. So we're going to play all the way through The Heavens Are Telling. Uh, I'll scroll through the pages. If you guys want to sing along, please sing out. You're at home. Uh, no one can hear you uh, except your, you know, who, with whom you live, your cats, your spouse, your children, whomever is there. But just sing your little hearts out. Uh, included in the Heavens Are Telling are three solo voices. Uh, and sing along in the solo lines if you want. And then you can put on your resume that you sang a solo with Berkshire Choral International. That's the way that works. Okay, first the moon and then the heavens are telling.
All right. I hope you enjoyed that. What a wonderful way to end day four and end part one of the Haydn creation. I should point out, and I should have mentioned earlier, that the three psalmists are given the name of angels. You have Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael. Uh, they sing throughout the first two sections. As I mentioned earlier, in part three, you have Adam and Eve. Generally speaking, the soprano, same soprano sings uh, Gabriel and Eve. Uh, sometimes you have the same bass singing Raphael and Adam. In this recording, as is often done, you have a bass singing Raphael and a baritone singing Adam, uh, uh, as, as is done here. All right, so let me call up the second part to what we're doing here. So we now begin day five, and uh, God starts to depict animals. And first up, we have birds with the soprano singing, and she gets to the point where she's talking about cooing. And here you'll hear the bassoons in pairs cooing. <laughs> Sounds better on the moon. And then you have the soprano trilling, and that's also most also a depiction of birds cooing. So we'll just listen to a little bit of this and uh, see how cleverly Haydn depicts the birds. Our next section, you know, I often describe creation as God uh, inventing and creating, you know, uh, light, darkness, plants, vegetation, uh, birds and the bees and the fishes in the deep blue sea, and then God created you and me. And right now, he's inventing the fishes in the deep blue sea. And what you have here, this is a trio for the soloists. And when the bass singer comes in, he's talking about the great whales. And I want you to see what's happening in the lower instruments in the orchestra. Here, the orchestra, the bass uh, instruments, the bass in, uh, double bass instruments are doing and you can picture whales leaping out of the ocean. Now, how Haydn knew this, you know, he lived in Austria, a landlocked country. He didn't travel as much as other composers. He spent most of his time in the court in Esterhazy uh, and uh, was, a, was a court musician. That was his full-time gig. Clearly, he knew enough to depict uh, whales leaping out of the sea. Uh, another very inventive moment. So here we go. Listen to the bass singer and the basses in the orchestra. Just a snippet, but you can see again how wonderfully inventive Haydn was. And now we get to more depictions of animals. 
So again, I've labeled it for you because Haydn gives you uh, the musical depiction and then tells you what you're listening to. Lions and tigers, no bears, oh my, uh, deer, horse, cattle, insect, and the very famous worm at the end. Now, I want to talk uh, a, a little bit about theory again. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it when we get there. So here's more depictions of animals and listen to how Haydn uh, depicts these various animals. After his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts on the earth, after their kind. Straight opening for fertile womb, the earth obeyed the word and team, creatures numberless. In perfect forms and fully grown. Okay, now I want to pause for a moment to talk a little bit about theory again. He ends in the key of D flat, right? And then goes immediately to A major. Notice how disjunct this is. This change, uh, the interval is called the tritone, an augmented fourth or diminished fifth. I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, but it's almost as far uh, in key relationships as you can get from one to the other. And by the way, it is, in this case, as far on the keyboard as you can get. The uh, tritone, the augmented fourth, divides an octave absolutely in half. So it's as far as you can get uh, without going back to, uh, you know, if you take an octave C to C, the tritone divides it absolutely in half. So I think that this change in key, this is my, my thoughts, depicts, if you will, uh, perhaps some of the more glamorous animals, the lion, the tiger, the deer, the horse, from the more lowly animals, the cows, the insect, and certainly the worm. And I think that's why he made such an abrupt key change. So we continue, listen to the uh, the cattle uh, grazing and moving quite slowly. Green. 
number the sands in swarms are lost, the host of insects. Isn't that wonderful? And this is why you want a bass singing Raphael. If he's got a low D on the word worm, uh, Gewurm in German, same thing. Uh, it's just, just a wonderful moment. Now the next uh, aria has what may be my favorite moment in the entire piece. It's a uh, score for bass soloist talking about um, now heaven in fullest glory shown, uh, all of the animals were about to get man and woman. And at this section here, starting um, with <coughs> pick up to measure 37 here, the German text, den Boden drückt der Tiere last, uh, meaning that the ground presses the animal's load. And on the word load here, last, Listen to what's happening in the orchestra. The bassoons and the, the uh, contrabassoon uh, have a low forte B flat, which sounds like the animal emitting a rude noise. So you have Dean Borden, the Richter Tier, to be subtle about it. And then the same thing happens here in measure 44 with a low C. So, as you can tell, I'm talking about Haydn, one of the most elegant composers, how much I adore his elegance, but I'm not above a whoopee cushion sound at the same time. So, let's listen to this aria, just a, a little bit of it, and pay attention to his incredible depiction in the orchestra. So as you can see, we've been talking about the beauty and elegance in Haydn's writing, but that's not to say I'm not above some jokes uh, on rude emissions from animals, shall we say. After God created the animals, he created his crowning achievement, human beings, as we end part two. And now we get into more theoretical talk, or talk about music theory, in that 
the end of part two is in B flat major, and the beginning of part three in the Garden of Eden is in E major. So again, we have the interval of a tritone, by which we mean augmented fourth or diminished fifth. It gets its name tritone because it is three whole steps. And we're talking about praising God, uh, exalted, he reigns on high, and the juxtaposition between that and humans on earth. So we end in B flat. And the next thing we hear is a jolting juxtaposition of keys. And this is the interval of a tritone, which uh, is um, the most dissonant interval we have. Uh, it was depicted in the Middle Ages as the devil in, in music, Diabolus in Musica. It was uh, forbidden uh, in earlier times. And this is absolutely a depiction of the difference between God on high and humans on earth. This change from this, sorry, <laughs> to this. How much more different could we be? So the Garden of Eden begins with a beautiful pastoral setting. We'll listen to just a little bit of it, and then we'll have one more choral uh, section for you all to sing after this. So just uh, due to time constraints, we're going to skip over to the end and the last chorus uh, after the Garden of Eden. And I want to just mention at this point, you know, that um, Haydn set this work for three soloists, soprano, tenor, and bass, except for this last movement when you need an alto soloist. Now, the alto soloist comes in and sings four bars. Here, amen. That's it. She sings that word four times. Yeah, da 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 bum. I counted it up. It's 32 notes. But you need someone to sing that. Almost all the time, they bring in uh, someone from the chorus to come front and sing this. But many of you longtime BCI singers will remember Trudy Weaver Miller, who was on the faculty uh, and then became the president and executive director. She tells a wonderful story. She's a mezzo-soprano. She made her Carnegie Hall debut being hired to sing the alto solos in 
creation, which means all of four bars. She walked on at the end uh, uh, for the final chorus. She said she had to wear a full diva gown. She sang glorious bows at the end. They gave her flowers. She said she was never more embarrassed in her entire life. And that was her Carnegie Hall debut. So all of you tonight, including you altos, get to sing the solos in this final chorus. We're going to hear the wretched ative, um leading up to it. And then I hope you'll all sing the final chorus uh, as we close this incredible, incredible work. Here we go. Not misled by false conceit, he strive at more than granted is, and more to know than though he should. Gentlemen, I give you the creation by Haydn. Isn't that wonderful? I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I tell you, for me, this is one of the depictions of great art. I can't tell you how many times I've done this piece, sung it, prepared choruses, conducted. I never conducted the whole thing, but I've certainly conducted excerpts. And it still moves and thrills me every single time. 
be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please also visit BerkshireCoral.org and navigate to our Singer Resources page. There you'll find information on upcoming programming, additional educational opportunities, and vocal exercises.